<clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Simpson. Mr. Cloud? Thank you once again. And I have, I think, what is a little more technical, uh, some questions. Okay. Uh, in January, the IRS announced that the total amount of recoveries from wealthy individuals as a result of the IRA funding was $520 million, uh, and uh, that's about 5% of the $10 billion increase of revenue that CBO projected for FY23 and 24. Now, part of that, I think, has a huge part to do with CBO's penchant to over overinflate the benefits and under-inflate uh, the cost of anything we're evaluating. Um, you would, I would guess, say, you know, if we had more help, more people, and more time, we could probably get that done. Uh, but going back to the issue on the teleworking that we touched on briefly, Briefly, I wanted to ask you very specifically, uh, earlier this year, you set a goal for employees to be in the office uh, back to just 50% of the time in May. Um, how many days per pay period do you require your uh, your DC-based managers, employers covered by collective bargaining agreements to be physically in the office? Uh, well, it's half. So if there's uh, 10 days in a pay period, it would be five days. Uh, um, and so it's, they, they, and let me also offer that uh, what, what we are requiring is consistency with the government-wide standard issued by the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, part of right. what we have to evaluate with respect to telework is a couple of things. Are we achieving our productivity goals? And we had a very strong filing season, so in many ways a lot of our productivity goals were achieved. We have to stay competitive in the labor market and we want to make sure that we're providing good flexibility versus what other employers might provide, and we want to meet the government-wide standard. So there's a lot to balance here. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, we're, we're talking with OMB about the government-wide standard because, of course, these teleworking practices were put in under COVID, meant to be temporary, and coming out of COVID, they've been made permanent. Um, now, from a business perspective, you know, when you're making this decision, you're thinking, okay, I'm going to take a probably a short hit, uh, somewhat of a hit in productivity from working at home, but hey, we, we don't have the facility usage, so there's savings there. Can you submit to us what savings we've been able to gather? I mean, are there offices you've been able to, to close it's, down, maintenance? You, believe it or not, it's, it's, it's mixed. In some locations, we have space issues. Uh, because because people are uh, shifting to smaller telework footprints uh, over time uh, and and working on site. In some cases, we have excess real estate, and we're working to uh, to offload that that real estate. Um, it's not always the case that you lose productivity when people are working off site. It just depends on the no, situation. No, a lot of it depends on the individual, right? And the situation. Um, the IRS has committed a, a significant resource to ensure taxpayers who navigate the 7,000-page tax code pay the proper amount, which they should. Uh, that's the job. Uh, but uh, we were talking about the uh, uh, the whoop. Uh, FY23, Treasury reported a staggering 33% of improper payments for the uh, earned income tax credit. So we were just talking about yes. that. Uh, what are you doing to reduce those improper payments. Yeah, this is a really important point because it is that uh, that high improper payment rate that uh, that I believe led to the the large number of audits uh, in this program. Well, we have to balance. There is a part of that error rate that is more concerning than another part of that error rate. So, part of that error rate is direct fraud or a uh, or a. Um, a nefarious preparer who steals the EITC from the eligible applicant. Um, and part of that error rate is uh, the dependent child lived with the parent for uh, four months out of the year rather than six months out of the year, and that's the eligibility issue. In a constrained resource environment, we have to make choices. And Can you break that down for us, maybe? That 33%, I mean, 33%. Yeah, what, yes, we can get you more information on that. I would say that a large part of the error is kind of more of this technical error where it's the number of months you've lived with your dependent child. Where my commitment is, is on EITC improper payments, is to go after and correct the errors that are more nefarious, that are uh, more uh, likely to compromise trust in the tax system. I wish we could get all the error. But we have to prioritize. I have just a couple of seconds. I, I don't have any reason 
to think anything about these questions except uh, you mentioned that uh, the IRS does not sell data. I was happy to hear that, but that sparked a couple questions for me. Please. Do you purchase data? Do we purchase data? I don't believe we purchase data. I, I mean, and, maybe and we purchase uh, benchmark information on real well, estate. Well, on, on individuals, on people. No, we yeah, do not. On, on citizens. We uh, do not. Do you share data with other agencies, or do other agencies have access to your data without a warrant or subpoena? Yes, under Section 6103 of the code, there are statutorily established um, data sharing uh, environments uh, where, like, for example, we share data with HHS uh, to help uh, th with their child support enforcement. We share data with the education department as around uh, 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 aligning with student aid eligibility. So there are these buckets of areas, but otherwise, beyond if it's not prescribed in statute in section 6103, we do not share it. Thank you very much. I yield back.